is Tariq Talk. Your host, Tariq Mendez, takes you on a journey with guests from all around the world. Broadcasting around the world. Around the world. This is Tariq Talk. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank I'm you. honored. Thank you. Um, this is actually will be the first episode for season three. So what better, what better way to have the one, the, the only Tris right here today with us? Thank you for having me. Uh, it's great that you do this. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Um, so do you want to start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? My name is Tris. I have lived in Hudson County for more than thirty years, and in that time that I've been in Hudson County, I have done a lot of writing. Some of it's been for publications, the Hudson County Publications. Uh, I think I've written for every indie publication that has come up in Jersey City. Uh, I've done a lot of writing on my own, um, and I've also, in that time, done writing that is not journalism, uh, either fiction or nonfiction, and I've also written a lot of music. <laughs> so. I've been around and there's probably too much of me out there, but I, I've definitely been out there. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. What's your like creative process? Because I noticed when you came during a studio visit during our cry, R150, um, one thing that I observed that I thought was so amazing is how attentive you are to these days. Um, I had like a few other people in, the, in my studio and they kind of like look at things and they take a picture or two and they try to like do everything by memory. But I noticed like the questions you ask, like how long you look at the pieces and now you take pictures of all, every piece that you're interested in. I thought that was like so inspiring, you know, and I, w- I was like, oh my gosh, you're so attentive. Um, so can you tell us a, a little bit about your creative process? I've been doing reviews for uh, NJArts.com and Jersey City Times, especially Jersey City Times for the past, uh, for the past two years. and. Because of that, I feel that to some degree I have a professional obligation to be as attentive mm-hmm. as I can be. But even if I didn't, I think I would still, if I walk into a gallery or if I walk into a show or a studio, I'm thinking about, well, the first thing that I'm thinking about is what is it that drove this artist to put in the time and effort to make the pieces that they made? Because you're talking about something that not only is a lot of time, a lot of time, but it's also there's an emotional investment too for the artist. Almost always, you're seeing a work that they've done that they've really put their heart into. Uh, they wouldn't do that unless they had something that was burning that they wanted to say to you. Mm-hmm. So I feel that it is my responsibility to be as attentive as I can be, and I think that anybody who walks in. On somebody because you're really seeing you're, you're seeing a piece of not to be cheesy but you're seeing a piece of their soul there you're seeing a, you're seeing a piece of their heart wow, and they're putting it on the it wall and they're giving it all to you and all you've really got to do is open your eyes as wide as you as you can and take it in as best as you can so and to try to be attentive and try to figure out what it is that they're trying to communicate uh, to you and sometimes it's sometimes they might not even know um, sometimes uh, artists aren't really thinking, um, they don't necessarily have the idea first and then they paint to the idea or they sculpt to the idea. Uh, the idea may come out as they're, uh, as, they're, as they're doing their work, but it doesn't really matter. They're still trying to communicate something to you, otherwise they wouldn't, yeah. they, they wouldn't take the risk of putting it out in public. So then it's on you to be as good a, an audience member, as good a listener, and as good a respondent mm-hmm. as I can be. And so that's kind of what I think of. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And I have to add, um, when you did the review for us, for the group show that we did at uh-huh. R150, I think it was May last year. Impact, yeah. Um, you know, there's like logistics problem, like lighting, like everybody was upset by certain lights that yes. wasn't working. But then I remember the exact moment you like wrote the review and the review went live for us. Yes. Like we were like, me and a few people, we were running around seeing who was like there that was part of the show that was in the studio. Yeah. We were like, oh my God, guess what, guess what, we got we to review. Like, because we're trying to bring everybody to the yeah. common space to read it together. It was like this, I don't know, like this collective, like, 
it felt like I was like in Warhol's factory. You know what I mean? Like we were just, like so excited. So thank you for that. I was like, that makes me. We were happy. so much fun, and everyone's like, what happened? What happened? And I'm like, we got a review. Come, come read it. We're gonna read it in the comment stage. Yes. But yeah, so. Um, thank you so much for everything you do for our community and how you highlight everything. I mean, I always think you must be so busy because you, you're, like, your reviews are always, like, as soon as the show premieres, it just comes right out. I'm like, oh my God, this guy is so ambitious and organized and amazing. I've tried to be comprehensive because there's yeah. so much that is happening. And um, I think that, uh, as you said, like, there's a certain novelty in Hatsukani to getting your work reviewed, which really shouldn't be, but it's always kind of been that way. It's hard to get, it's hard to find criticism. It's not really something that we do as well as we do the art. So there was definitely, there's definitely a need for it because mm -hmm. we do want to talk about it yeah. and it does help. When I do anything that I do, I always, I'm always hoping that somebody will tell me, right? something or listen to it and give me uh, and let me know what they think yeah. or, 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 or how they felt about it so I guess I'm trying to return the favor in yeah. advance <laughs> <laughs> no I have to tell you like every even like for the the, the most recent article you did like three shows like yeah was it oh my god we, like it wasn't my show but everybody for the lobby show and the upstairs everybody was so excited that you yes. did that yeah, like we're all like supporting each other. Like, hey, do you see the link? Check this out. Share yeah. it on Instagram. You know, yeah. do as much as you can. So yeah, that's amazing. It's like really hard to, you know, come by people that are so genuine like you, talented of course, but also you go above and beyond and you care a lot, like the little details. That Thank you. That's truly amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Creatively, like my brain is always on. I'm always like thinking of ideas and yeah. inspired. Are you that type of person? Like you're always on the go kind of like with your creative brain? Yes, I'm always thinking about, yes, I'm, I'm always, I'm always putting sentences together in my head and I'm always turning them around in my head and I'm always thinking about how, how I could better say what I'm trying to say because you know, writing about art is kind of um, a challenge for me. I don't really have an arts background uh, uh, at all. Oh my god! I, I really? don't really know anything about visual. I really don't. I, mean, I always say I don't really know anything about visual art. You're so art. descriptive. Wow. Yes, I don't really know anything about visual art. Um, I am completely self-taught. I started going to museums all the time. Um, maybe about ten years ago, mm -hmm. I started covering all the museum shows in New York. And when I did, I mean, I didn't know anything past. Mm -hmm. You know, Andrew Wyeth was about. You know, I knew about that. I knew about Grant Wood. That's yeah. basically what I knew about. I knew about some American uh, painters. But I, did, I knew very little uh, besides that. So I'm not a person who knows about much about visual art. So it's always a bit of a challenge. Uh, and learning the language to write about something that you don't really know that much about can be difficult and coming up with your own way of putting things can, can be tricky. So I'm always turning sentences around in my head. Oh, wow. I'm always trying to figure out what I actually think about something um, because the task always becomes make your real human reaction show on the page uh, if you can. Mm -hmm. So make that make that appear if you can. And um, yes, it, I never really, I wake up and I think about like what I'm gonna write that day. Oh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean one of my first thoughts in the morning is like, I'll try to formulate a paragraph while I'm just getting my eyes ready to go. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's actually gonna be, that was gonna be my next question. Like, yes. how is your writing process? Like are you like a nine ten person or you, like a morning person, as you said? I'm frequently a train person. I, I do a lot of writing on the train because if oh, I'm traveling oh. e to a practice or I'm traveling to a show yeah. or something, I'll bring the laptop on the train. Oh, okay. And it's good because there aren't any distractions yeah. and I can sit there and I can and I, I can write like that. When I used to cover uh, pop shows, which I did quite a lot in Newark, I, I covered pretty much any pop star who came to Newark, I wrote about the show. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, deadlines for newspapers are very tight so I would have to write something on the train so I'd get out of the Prudential Center or uh, oh. uh, or and I'd immediately get on the path train and then the time on the path train back to Jersey City I would think you know, I'd write the review of the show That's so if it was like Lady Gaga was playing uh, at Rose Prudential Land. Center oh, uh, okay. Prudential, yeah. yeah I mean Roseland yeah. oh did you see Lady Gaga at Roseland no I, I had did tickets you? but I got sick 
Yeah, I, I saw Lady Gaga that. do a fantastic show at Roseland, yeah. which was really just her. On, it was a small scale show. It yeah. was really her on the piano. And if you if you have never, if you're a fan, uh, which I, I, she's not my favorite pop star, but I have a tremendous amount of respect for her. She's a great, great singer Absolutely. and a really cool piano player. And she and she did a lot of stuff that was it was a much more intimate setting, mm -hmm. and it kind of gave you a sense of where she was going in her career. This yeah. was right. Or, this was at. This was post Monster Ball. Oh, that okay. was another one that was very cool to see, write about immediately. And wow. then, yeah. So I do a lot of writing very, when I'm in my groove, I do a lot yeah. of writing very fast. I have the experience, it's oh, an emotional yeah. experience, yeah. and I, I, I kind of try to write about it when I can. I'm just so impressed that one, you can write so quickly and so well, and then two, of all places in the whole earth, you can write on the train. Yes, like the train is fun to write on. That's amazing. It is. Like, because just because of, I mean, I'm very easily distracted, like, and I get heart sick, so for me, the train is just, like, <laughs> mentally, I'm just like, okay, you're almost there, you're almost there. Yeah. So the fact you're able to, like, zoom out and concentrate and do it so well, that's amazing. Thank you. I love hearing that. And um, changing topics for really quick, because we, we were just talking about your playing. Um, there's a show that I always wish I went to was with Yoko Ono and uh -huh. Gaga. Did you ever... I, I, I knew that that existed, but I yeah, never, yeah. I, I didn't see it. It just reminded me of that. Yeah. I, I thought you would yeah. appreciate it, but I, yeah. um, that's like a performance I wish I went, and it's yeah. like a pretty cool era. And who are your, like, who are your inspirations? Like, where do you get inspired? Are you, are you, like, inspired by, like, people, by conversation, or by nature? Inspired to write. I guess I'm most inspired by the stuff that I am seeing. If I go and I see it, I, I see your show. Mm -hmm. I will try to be attentive to the textures that you're using, uh, the colors that you're using, uh, the the rhythms that are in yeah. your work, and I'll try to when I write uh, a review of the show, I'll try to not just describe but impart a little bit of that aesthetic to what I'm writing. So, uh, let's say I'm writing about Susan Evans Grove. Mm -hmm. There is uh, there's there's a real rhythm to her work, yeah. and I think I've tried to replicate that rhythm in the stuff that I've written about her. So my most direct inspiration is whatever it is that I'm writing about. Oh, wow. In the general sense, as a writer, um, I'm inspired by a huge, a, a huge uh, influence on me, and this is kind of funny, uh, a, a big influence on, on my writing. Uh, I mean, I have very standard influences. Um, Salinger is a big influence. Uh, George Bernard Shaw is a big influence. But um, Mike Lupica, the col newspaper columnist, okay. uh, when I was a young person, I would read. He was a sports columnist, and, and he would, uh, and I would read the uh, the Daily News. I was really amazed and impressed by the way in which Mike Lupica would write to the moment, mm -hmm. and he would do a great job of just writing exactly what happened in the game that night, yeah. and he would make it succinct and really cool. And I was like, this just happened, and here he just turned around and he wrote about it, and I could tell that he was. That, that there was an intellectual and emotional connection that he was having with what was happening on the field. And I was like, I was like, when I write, when I start writing about music, because <laughs> even as a kid, I, I always knew I would write about music. I was like, I want it to be like that. I want it to be, and I want it to be fast. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to labor over it. I want it to be exactly how this experience made me feel. Uh, I want it to be a real human reaction to that. And I felt like, I, I kind of wanted it to be like Mike Lupica. And so that was definitely, an, that was, that was a, a uh, that's an unusual, um, I don't think, that there's probably not a lot of people who um, write about visual art who are inspired by sports writers, but, but maybe, maybe there are. Maybe, maybe there's more overlap, yeah. yes. Absolutely um, cool. Newspaper writers. I always thought it was very, very cool to write for the newspaper. Um, I've always loved writing for newspapers, and I think it's really cool to do it, and the idea of having a really tight deadline and getting right to it um, is inspiring to me. Yeah. The excitement of doing that, the excitement of being in the newsroom, which is we're losing that, but uh, yeah. the excitement of that mm -hmm. uh, is something that has always inspired me. Uh, other writers are working in on it, other yeah. writers. And we're working in Jersey City is a lot of fun because there is so much to write about mm -hmm. and there's so much to be inspired by. Oh wow. um, and another question, when you have an assignment, like you have to go to a show or a scene or something specific, and when you're reviewing the art, are you able to enjoy it? Or like in the back of your mind, like, okay, I have to write about this. Have to, or can you like take a full, like, you know, let's say like, an ex like enjoy the experience from like a, a normal perspective, like of a person, just a viewer? Or are you thinking like critically? 
about okay, I want to highlight this, I want to do that, or do you enjoy the experience first and then you do like the business part of it later? That's a really good question, and the answer is that I don't know how to go to a show and not think critically, and that can be a that could be a criticism of me. Um, why can't you just go and enjoy it? Yeah. But I am always okay. So. Um, just to explain why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. For years and years and years, I wrote about popular music. I did popular music, I wrote about popular music. It's what I know about. And I would take my partner, who, alas, is no longer with us. She died last year. Um, and for Sorry. years, we would go to the shows, mm -hmm. and we would see the shows. And throughout the show, she was, and she was, um, she was, she was, the Eng she was the chair of the English department at New Jersey City University. Oh, wow. She was a writer and a word person too, and she was a critic. Um, uh, in everything that she did, she was she had a critical eye. She cast a critical eye around the world. Was, that's how she lived. Um, and we would go together, and we would sit there, and we would watch the rock show, and we'd rock out or the yeah. pop show. We'd go see Taylor Swift, and we would go see Beyonce, and rock out, and we would love it. And it was a wonderful time. But the whole time, you know, we were thinking, and and then part of the enjoyment of it was that we would go home, and we spend the next day taking it apart. You know, why did this work? We were you talk, able to talk to each other? We would other? talk about it, yes. Wow. Why did this work? What was exciting? Yeah. How did this work on me emotionally? Oh how, how did, we would, we would go, we would, we would honestly go song by song, and go through the wow. set list and be like, it was amazing when she did that. That didn't work. We would just talk about the whole thing. And part of the excitement for me was having that conversation with her, and then writing the writing a review of the show was in a way an extension of that conversation. Yeah. I was letting other people into what we did naturally. And even before I had a column, we would do that. We would go out and we'd see friends and we'd talk about it. When she got sick, she got very, very sick. She got sick in 2018. Um, and she had been sick before that. Um, it became impossible to go see Drake and have her sing yeah. at Drake's show. It, it, it became impossible for us to do that. So I thought that a thing that we could do, or that, that we could do together, was we could start, we could go to the visual arts shows, and we could have the same conversation around visual arts that we used to have around, yeah. around music. And that was very easy, and, we would, and it, was, it was easy for her to do. We could go uh, see a show for 15 minutes, and then spend the evening talking about what we saw. So we started going to museum shows, we started going much more to shows in Jersey City. And that is really how I reoriented myself and became and started doing what I've been doing, which is writing about about this stuff, which also moves me very deeply. Yeah. Um, but the other half of the, of it is that I write about Jersey City because we are, because Jersey City is the is a wonderful place to a wonderful place to see visual art. There are so many fantastic artists here, and people don't know that, and they have been under publicized. And anything that I can do to make people more aware of what's happening in Jersey City, I will do because it's very exciting. So, yes, having that critical, do I roll in and do I ever just enjoy and just enjoy it without thinking critically? No, I can't do that. I mean, I've trained myself, and and part of it was with Hillary, you had to be critical. So everything was, but but the, the criticism was part of the fun, and it never took away from how much enjoyment we took from seeing the stuff. Even shows that we didn't love, we still had a wonderful time talking about. Um, I bet those conversations were so fulfilling. Yes, they were very fulfilling, yeah. and you know, That's and you know, and I, and <clears throat> you know, sorry, excuse me. It's okay. <clears throat> I, uh, I, you know, there are. I get a little emotional thinking about this stuff because it was. I mean, I'm emotional just yeah. hearing you describe. Yeah, because it was really, uh, it was a very important part of our relationship that we talked about everything I mean you know, we, we talked about everything yeah. and uh, I love doing that now I have uh, I have a new partner and she means everything to me she's fantastic and she has a totally different way of looking at art um, but you know equally exciting and equally wonderful and like it is great to talk to, to her about it. So now when we go to shows, um, I take her to art shows, and, uh, and she, and we talk about it all the time. We have those conversations. So I'm going to have those conversations with, with somebody, always, and I'm never going to not be, never going to not have a critical eye when I walk in.
but it doesn't mean that I'm not enthusiastic. Yeah, I'm yeah. always enthusiastic. Yeah, I'm just I get very excited. Yeah, yeah. We're seeing all the same art. Way. Yeah, 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 seeing art excites yeah. me. Yes. Yeah, because like whenever I see paintings, and a lot of my friends are like, "My God, just enjoy the art, just uh-huh. you know," because I'll I'll look at from like a painter's perspective, and I'd yeah. be like, "Oh, where did I start? What did they finish? Like, why did they use this? You know yeah. what I mean? That's how I work. And then when I'm done, kind of like analyzing it, like in an artistic way, I'm like. Oh my gosh, this is really beautiful. Like, you know what I mean? Like, do you I find yourself applying it to the stuff that you do? Then, then you see. Yeah, it? sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I'm just like, for me, I always curious. Like, yeah. I'm also curious about the creative process. Like, what what was the artist going through? Did they paint this? Yeah. Like during like a turmoil or a happy moment. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I always like totally. the behind. Yes. Much more than the actual artwork. Uh-huh. Like, I like the journey and the process yes. m- much more than the yeah. finished product. You know. Yes. Because without that, there's no finished product. So when you're there, you're looking at it and you're wondering about the journey. Yeah. You're wondering about, like, where yeah. did, what was the process that got, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. I love, like, sometimes, like, seeing if, like, they painted something first and maybe they painted on top. Sometimes totally. I do that yes. a lot. I'm yeah. like, oh, my gosh, I do that, too. That, you know what I mean? Like, you have that connection to the painting. Painting as, as a kind of overriding. Yeah. You have a, a first idea, a first yeah. draft, and then you can see traces of the first yeah. draft. So it's like, how did that first draft influence what it became? Yeah. 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 All I of love, that stuff. I love when people, like, sometimes I used to, like, if I messed up, I would start again or just, like, yeah. rip certain pieces and put, like, a sculpture or something. But now I kind of, it's almost like, I don't know how to describe it. You remember, do you remember, like, in the 90s, where's Waldo? Yes. So I kind of, like, if I mess up nowadays, yeah. I kind of just, like, paint it over, but very subtle. Uh-huh. So if somebody's really paying attention, they'll see there's something underneath yes. there, you know? And I always love when people are like, hey, did you mean to paint that bathtub yeah. without, like, a ladder on top of it? My like, great idea. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but I just left you it. You can in. find Waldo. In there. Yeah, exactly. Waldo I, w- I always try to like. Yeah. It's a little similar to like where's Waldo. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I also want to talk about the beautiful pictures on your Instagram. Thank you. I love. There's like a specific one by the park. I don't know what park it is, but the lighting and the shadows onto the pavement. I know the one that you mean. Yeah. Yes. It was a beautiful day in Lincoln Park in Jersey City. Oh, okay. City. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That one, yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, well, I don't think of myself as a photographer, but. Uh, all of the artists in Jersey City are, are, are on Instagram. Yeah. So I felt like it was the best way to communicate um, directly with them might be to cultivate more of an, ins- of an Instagram presence than I had, which was basically nothing. Yeah. So I started to post uh, my photographs around town uh, to accompany links to what I'd written. So mm-hmm. if I have a review up, I might do an Instagram picture that has something to do with, yeah. with what it is that I've reviewed. Um, but I think what I don't do a, a good enough job of telling people, even in the art scene, is that my novel, I've, I've written a lot of stuff, and I've also, I've also written a novel, mm-hmm. and here I am hedging again about it. Uh, it's called The Trespassers, and it is about photographers. It's about young photographers. Yeah. So I've been thinking about photography for a long time, and the way that, the way that photography mediates seeing um, for a very long time, because I wrote that novel uh, more than 10 years ago. And it was published in 2012, a long time ago. Um, but it is, of all the things that I've done, the thing that means the most to me. And I feel like everything that I've written since has been a kind of restatement. And certainly the photographs that I do for Instagram um, are uh, an attempt to get back into the world of the trespassers, uh, to get back into the world of those characters. Yeah. Because what they do and what happens in the story is they, it's a uh, group of five young, uh, five teenagers who spend a summer breaking into abandoned buildings and taking photographs of the inside of the building. That's really all that happens in the book. It's not really um, plot-driven. It's more character-driven, and it's about their experience of the landscape. Uh, But those photographs um, that I take are kind of, I I sometimes get myself in the mind of of those characters. They never really left me behind. So when I'm taking a trip around Jersey City, I might take something that I think one of the characters might appreciate. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're still, uh, they're still very alive to me, even mm-hmm. though it was a long time ago that I wrote it. Um, it's still the thing that I think about can the most. Can we purchase that somewhere? Yes, it's, it's still, it's, uh, I am going to be doing, uh, I'm going to, in September, I'm going to be doing a performance at the Art House uh, oh, wow. for Jersey City Fridays. So I'm going to be uh, playing songs from my Best Liked album, which is now 20 years old, called Shootout at the Sugar wow. Factory, and we made it 20 That's years so ago. Cool. Yes, and we're going to do a Return to the Sugar Factory show. And at the Return to the Sugar Factory show, I hope to have a lot of Tris McCall material available. So I, I hope the book will be there, and 
get a copy of it there. Uh, awesome. You can get a copy of it on Amazon as well. Oh, it's on Amazon as a CD? Yeah, I think it is. Oh, my I God, everybody, please stop what you're doing and go well, purchase okay. it now. And, and now, now it's time for me to do what, I, what, I, what I always do, which is, which is to give, um, which is to warn people that the book is, people, some people, well, here I am talking down on, on the thing that means the most to me. What does that say about me? What does it say? Here I um, it's a wonderful book, and everybody should read it. That's how I feel. Let me just leave it at that. I me it means so much to me. Uh, the music, it's very easy for me to say that if you enjoy synth pop, synth rock, if you like that kind of thing, if you like a certain kind of indie rock style with synthesizers, you will definitely enjoy it. The album Shoot Out Sugar Factory, and you will, and you will even enjoy even more the experience of seeing me perform it. Um, but we'll be doing that September 8th at September Art House. 8th, September okay. 8th at Art House. I'm going to Marine Boulevard, right? Oh, yeah, right, yes. It's in the new Art House Theater, yeah. and I'm going to make a huge deal out of it. Oh I'm going to tell everybody. We should that. also get a. Uh, yeah. it we will should be also a do a book signing, please. Yes, it will be a free show. So anybody who wants to. to the only thing it will cost you to have the Trist McCall experience is about 45, mi 45 to 60 minutes of your time, and uh, maybe. Maybe some of the cilia in your ear because we will be relatively loud. It will be a rock oh show. My God, I love that. And we're going to try to incorporate visual elements into the show. I'm not exactly sure yet how or what shape that's going to take, but I think we really want to avail ourselves of the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we'd love for there to be projections and things that I actually act out to the audience oh, wow. to make the songs clear to people. So it's going to be a really cool show, I think. That sounds and, amazing. Yeah, and the book will be available there. Uh, and. So the Instagram, I think of as just a, a little fraction of yeah. the trespassers. Like, I think of that as something that, um, would those characters even use Instagram? Well, a couple of them would. Yeah. Uh, some of them would, would probably not, but a couple of them probably would, and I think that that might be, I still see things through their eyes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because the reason I brought up the Instagram, because I always admire how you're able to maybe like find beauty in decay or like you uh -huh. know the urban areas where sometimes it's like barely li like lit or there's like a big yes. trash can that's overflowing you take it in such a way that you're like oh my gosh there's like a romantic poetry to this yes. you know yes. and i always wonder is like is she just like <laughs> randomly taking a picture and it turns out beautiful or is she actually like thinking about it there's like a dialogue well, no that makes so much sense i think the theme of the trespassers is l learning to love as uh, as learning to see as a way of learning to love. Mm -hmm. um, these characters have to, they, they're young, they have mm -hmm. to learn to love each other. The narrator really has to learn how and who to love. And uh, I think that training his eye to see things, and you learn first to look. At first you're looking at something and it doesn't seem like anything to you. And then the closer you look and the more it observes, the more it, it may trigger emotions. And the more you observe and, and and the more you can focus, I think, the more you open up your own heart and your own possibilities, possibilities of understanding and seeing. Yeah. So that's really what the book is about. Um, uh, it's set in Hudson County, so oh. they're exploring a lot of factories in Hudson County in the year 2004. Um, but yes, I have the same feelings that my characters do, which is every old building has a story, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, every place that you're looking at has a story. Everything that you see uh, tells something. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking around this room, and the way the light catches on the soundproofing. Oh yeah, it's something. cool, right? Your shirt tells me something. Your, your yeah. this microphone tells me something. Like Every, subtle thing. Yeah. Everything has a story. Yeah. And you just try to attune yourself to yeah. that story. I love how you're so observant, even with the <laughs> your latest picture. It had like I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correct or a wood pallet. Is that how you say it? What? It's it's like a. a like there's like the wood lean on the wall. It was just oh yes, a lot of cell yes. Know, recent picture yeah, that was in Philadelphia. Yeah, I saw a leaning. Um, that looked really cool. I think it was the colors that I appreciated there. Mm -hmm. That and that and that the leaning the leaning palette was yeah. a participant. Yeah. In in a conversation, I think between a wall and a door. Yeah. Because some of the same color paint was on there, yeah. and it was like it was trying to be more like the wall and the door. Yeah. It was. It, it felt aspirational yeah, to me. It did. And there was a no trespassing sign and some barbed wire there, <laughs> so it seemed like there was danger. Yeah. So it's kind. Of, so to me, yes. To me, the little leaning palette was the main character, mm -hmm. and he or she or it was attempting to adapt to an environment to an environment under dangerous conditions. That was the story that that picture told me. And that's the emotion that I felt when I saw that poor guy. It, it's just a little wooden crate leaning up against the wall. But of course, anything that's a little forlorn looking, I'm going to identify with. So. Oh, wow, that's amazing. <laughs>
And I'm very excited, um, going back to the art house, you, you said it would be part of one of the JC Fridays. Yes, it's going to be JC Fridays for September 8th, and that's going to be 8th, okay, me okay. and a full band, me with my battery synthesizers, doing what I do, making a racket, yeah. and singing songs essentially about New Jersey. Because Shoot Out of the Sugar Factory is an album about uh, urban life, but specifically urban life in, in uh, Hudson County. All the songs are either set in Union City or mm -hmm. Jersey City, and uh, they're all written about my experiences here, mm -hmm. or written from the perspective of characters that I invented mm -hmm. that were that live in, in Hudson County. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's what the album's about. Yeah. Oh, well, that's beautiful. Um, I always wanted to double ask that because when I had the idea for this podcast, what uh -huh. I really wanted to do was. Um, you know, most podcasts they interview a guest and that's it, though. It's just lifetime until you know. <laughs> but what I want, I was curious to do was kind of like every year interview the same person, yeah, to see how they see see how they're doing. Yeah. But now that you're saying that, I think it's, it's like so idea. it's almost like a retrospective of your life, the yes. performance of somebody there's at our house. Uh, unfortunately, there's too much of me to retrospectivize easily, and because there's just a lot, there's way too much of me out, out on the internet, like mm -hmm. there's so much silly business, yeah. Um, and it's hard to know what's worth paying attention to and what isn't. So I guess, I guess I'm trying to curate myself a little bit here by putting things forward that I think people should know about. Yeah. Um, but I think that people should, should probably... These songs were designed um, for a concert setting. Mm -hmm. So they were designed to be, um, they were designed for, to be part of a rock show. Yeah. Uh, and so they've never really fallen out of the repertoire because anytime we need to do uh, a, a rousing rocker. Yeah. You can always take something from sh from Shoot Out of the Sugar Factory. That's where I, th that's sort of the repository of, yeah. my, of my more crowd pleasing material. Oh, so you're going to get it all at once. And the book will be there and you can take it or leave it. I hope you take it. And I hope when you do take it that you read it with an open heart. That's because, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm getting my copy as soon as we finish with this <laughs> podcast. I'm ordering my copy and I'll yeah. definitely do a five star review. I, I, I hope expect everybody listening. I hope you enjoy it. I have I'm a question. Yeah. Is your music on streaming platforms? So oh, yeah, totally. Totally. And you see, when, there was a time, uh -huh. um, really the, the, the decade of the OOs, mm -hmm. there was a time when music was pretty much all I did. And I played in a lot of different bands. Mm -hmm. I played in a bunch of indie pop bands, uh, a number of related bands, some of which I think are really excellent bands. Um, I played in a group called My Teenage Stride that I think... Um, I, I'm very, very proud of what I did in that group. And one of the groups that I played with back then, a group called Overlord, mm -hmm. is still around. Overlord still makes records, and I think Overlord is really as good as, as it has ever been when we get together. Unfortunately, our, our bass player, she now lives in California. So oh, it's wow. hard for, yeah. she's coming back tomorrow. Uh, I mean, we're taping this in yeah, April, so, so this will be way yeah. too late. But she's coming back tomorrow, she's gonna be in town. Um, we're gonna record, we're gonna do a show while she's around. Oh. And then she's going to fly back to California. So we'll probably tour in California. Yeah. But um, uh, but that was a group that I was with for a very long time. So during that time, I, I really did music all the time. And uh, I was, and my music was distributed according to, according to OO's technology. But the moment I started to really, when I really started to write rock criticism mm -hmm. in a way that it would have been a conflict of interest, I kind of stopped. Mm -hmm. So I tapered off in the middle of the OO's decade. And I really have not restarted the engine until recently, in a real way. Yeah. So it's possible to get all four of my albums. They all exist. I, I have not done anything to promote them since about the year 2007. Oh, wow. uh, it's been a really long time. Yeah. But uh, now I feel like I'm in a position where I can reintroduce myself to the town mm -hmm. uh, as someone who does have something to offer musically as well as, as a writer. So I think I'm letting people know that those records exist. So if you do look for Shootout at the Sugar Factory, it, it's there. And um, if you look at some of my other albums, the last thing I did was an album called Let the Night Fall, which is an also, also an album about New Jersey. Everything I write is about New Jersey. It's yeah. all about New Jersey. I've always lived in New Jersey. Everything I write about is about New Jersey. Well, it makes sense, yeah. yeah. It's, New Jersey is uh, your muse, you could say, right? It is. New Jersey is a muse, and New Jersey is a very specific muse. And you, you were asking before about inspiration. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it occurs to me that a better answer to your question, not that you should disregard the prior one, but a better answer to the question might be that um, I'm very deeply inspired by place. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when we're talking about what is the artist trying to communicate yeah. to you when you go into a gallery and, and you, you see what, they're, what, what they've put on the walls, what are they trying to say to you? 
so frequently in New Jersey, people really want to talk about New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And that's musicians, writers, artists. So much Jersey comes yeah. through, always. People are very proud to be from New Jersey. People are very curious about New Jersey, about what it does to you. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things that's, that, that is a running theme through Jersey City Art, you see in so many shows, over and over again, is we are very concerned about the environment here. We're very concerned about, not just about environmentalism, but what the environment in general, the effect that the environment has on us. You see work by William Anish, Susan Evans Grove before, by I think of Amanda Thackeray, Jody Fink, many people repurposing old junk and making it look beautiful again. What can we do with all of this stuff that's yeah. been thrown away? What is our relationship with the built environment? How does it make us feel? You see that over and over. And New Jersey has a post-industrial style. There is a way in which the old factories, the old rhythms, the, the old urban design filters through. Artists are sensitive people, and you see that in the canvases. You see that in what they're writing and what they're painting. You see that in the, mater in the materials that they use, and you see that very frequently in the colors that are used. Yeah. There's a lot of brick red used in Jersey. Yeah. There's a lot of industrial gray. Like a red ox. Yes, right. Color, yeah. A lot of institution green, yeah. a lot of textures that look old and industrial. Yeah. And the way that we bring that to life in our paintings, the way we reanimate it, you yeah. see it You see it all over the place. You see it in so many different shows. Uh, and that is a huge inspiration to me because yeah. I love New Jersey. I love encountering New Jersey. Yeah. And you know what, it's funny. You leave the, Jer the, the Jersey metropolitan area, you travel around the country, and you meet interesting people. And I say that so many of those interesting people have some Jersey in their background. Like yeah. either their family's yeah. from Jersey, or maybe they've been here for a little while, maybe they went to college in New Jersey, mm -hmm. but like it gets under your skin. Yeah. And people who leave New Jersey, they, they so frequently come back. Yeah, no, that yeah. is true. So yeah. it's true, it's a big inspiration for me. That's so funny because um, when you mentioned Susan Evans Grove, she was a, yeah. a she was, yeah, shout yeah. out to Susan. Yeah, shout but, um, out to Susan, a, a wonderful artist. Yes, her still lives, when you were talking about yes. the repurposing she did, um, her series that she brought, like uh, damaged goods of electronics yes. that weren't used anymore and mixed it with flowers and mm -hmm. showed like the decay yeah. of society in a way and like how harmful we are as humans to this planet and we are the invasive species you could yeah. say. But um, yeah, that's so uh, that's so amazing that you were both thinking the same thing in a way. And and, I, and a beautiful thing about Susan's still life, uh, uh, still lifes, um, is that not only do you get that message, yeah. and it's, it's a very clear envi environmentalist message that comes through her photographs, but you also get the beauty of the component. Mm -hmm. She really, she wants to let you know that, yeah. that the way we're living, maybe we should be better stewards of the yeah. planet, right? But she also loves how beautiful the motherboard is. Yeah. Oh she my loves God, how yeah. beautiful the wires are and how, yeah. the, and how the, the curve of the wires mimics the curve of yeah. the organic. New Jer in New Jersey, artists very frequently like to make connections between the organic and the inorganic. Mm -hmm. There was a beautiful show last year that was all about the embankment. It was the Embankment Preservation Society put out a show that was about the Sixth Street Embankment. And uh, so many so many of you, Eileen Ferrara did a beautiful job of, of making paper that kind of resembled rock. Uh, mm -hmm. And that merger between the organic and the inorganic, you, you see frequently in photographs, you see it in you see it in, in paintings, you see it in sculptures, and mm -hmm. it's another thing that we do, I think that we do very, very well. That's an amazing observation. Like, I, I kind of realized that subconsciously, but I never really put much thought, but the yeah. fact that you, like, put those two and two together, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You're right about that, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, it's an aesthetic. It's, yeah. it's part of what we do. Yeah. And I'm a Jersey loyalist, so yeah. I'm going to... I'm probably going to cut all kinds of slack for what we do anyway, but you don't have to cut a lot of slack for visual art in Jersey City because the stuff that here is so good and at any given time, and people don't know this, but they really should know this, at any given time in Jersey City, there are art shows going on that are as good, if not better, than art shows that you'll see almost any place else. Artists come here. Yeah. They know to, this is a magnet not just for the state. It's a magnet for people all over the region, all over the country. People come here because they understand that really good, really challenging, really unusual work is happening here. And it's very exciting work. It's inspiring. It's courageous work that's happening here. We don't have the publicity to let people know. That's why it's beautiful that you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. You're advertising. Some of the, the, and, well, not advertising. <laughs> you're talking to people. You're helping. I mean, uh, ho ho helping to let people know what we've got. Mm -hmm. Because what we've got is very, very special. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like it is... You know, we have the big places, Monica Contemporary, which more people should know about. Yeah. We have 150, the Gallery of the 150, Elevator, these, these incubators. Yeah. But then we have a backbone. Uh, we have a backbone of small galleries that do outstanding shows. 
really, really great shows. And just to throw in a couple. Um, and Novato's Gallery. And Novato's yeah. Gallery. Can't art be wall. missed. The art, uh, the, uh, the art wall and Novato's Gallery. And Novato has a beautiful standalone gallery mm. that's not that far from these yeah. other places. Really close to 150. Smush Gallery. Really audacious stuff. And, um, yeah. And deep, deep space. Yeah, deep space. Yeah. Deep space, which, which I get, a ch- I, I get the rock shells even talking about deep space. Yeah. Deep space, deep space is smush. Deep space, Ianta space, another one. Everybody should know about these mm-hmm. places because they do, they all have individual personalities, different personalities. Smush does multimedia stuff. Yeah. A lot of their thing, they're they're, they're interested in doing art at the intersections of dance and movement yeah. and uh, photography and music and. They really try to smush it all together in a really <laughs> small space and and see what happens and see if it holds together. Sometimes yeah. it holds together, sometimes it doesn't. But even when it falls apart, that can be what makes it exciting. Ianta Space is a couple of different artists with really expansive, interesting visions. And when they deck out their rooms, they do beautiful installations. There's a great one there right now. Uh, and Deep Space. Deep Space is a community of artists and great curators who do fantastic shows every month. And they just hit it out of the park time and time again, and it's a small gallery in a place in Jersey City, in a place in Jersey City that doesn't get a lot of foot traffic, yeah. it's Cornelison, um, but it is always worth checking out what they've got there, because it's always provocative, and it's always really playful, and it's often really, really nerdy, too, it's often really like, it's often really, it's like, uh, it, it, it can be people who are really in tune with like the world of action figures, or the world of, of uh, comic books, in a way that if, if that's in your background, you're going to you're going to vibe with that. Uh, one of the great shows that they had there last year was uh, was the Bark the Dog show, which is a wonderful show by a uh, painter who does very, very detailed, almost Hergé, uh, yeah. almost detailed to the level of Hergé, uh, of, of this little character, Bark the Dog, going through these amazing urban scenarios and machines that he built. Yeah, I saw the art there. Oh, yeah. it was so good. Uh, sculptures that were based on based on the, yeah. the, the, the painting. So yeah. you saw both, and you got to kind of experience to try to under, understand who this character was. Right now, Clarence Rich, who's a, a street artist whose work is all over Jersey City, you see his particular, he's got a really interesting visual signature, mm-hmm. and you see him on underpasses, and you see his work on, on walls all over the place. Uh, he, uh, he has a, a one-person show at Deep Space right now that doesn't, that isn't, it isn't that, it isn't the street work, it's actually, uh, Clarence Rich applying his style to uh, to classical motifs. So there's a lot of Greek gods that he's painting, Egyptian symbolism that he's painting, and it's they encourage people to do interesting things. Mm-hmm. You walk into that room and you feel more interesting. Uh, it is to visual art as Maxwell's was to music mm-hmm. in the in the. Uh, Maxwell's and Hoboken was to music, uh, just a place that you went into, and you almost felt more creative just being in the room. Smush has some of that too, Yanta Space has some of that. Novato Gallery is an absolutely beautiful space. Everything that Anne Novato puts there is just, it's stuff that just you, you're just fascinated yeah. by. Uh, she, she's got a tremendous eye, and she herself is a fantastic painter. Yeah. Um, and she doesn't always show her own stuff, mm-hmm. but whenever she does, like I, I, you know, my eye goes up. She, she's a wonderful painter. Uh, so and all of the people who are involved in this stuff are are they're all artists themselves. So they have, um, they and they have artistic projects going on, and it's always worth mm-hmm. engaging with what they do. But they're sort of the backbone of this whole thing. That's that's the small spaces, doing really audacious shows all the time. Shows that every I feel like everybody should know about. So yes, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I have a question since you've been in Jersey City so long all your life have you like how do you feel about the future like the you've seen this trajectory like you know more buildings going up yes. I feel like that's giving more opportunity to art spaces and yes. more opportunity like what do you hope for the future of Jersey City like, well in, in terms of art I hope we don't erase everything in our desire to make a lot of money mm-hmm. because Jersey City has it's been a boom city since, and on one level or another since I've moved here. So for 30 years, people have been talking about Jersey City as a place where you can go, you can buy property, and yeah. the value of that property will appreciate. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in the mid-00s, we had a terrible casualty of just that, which is that we had a wonderful art center at 111 Front Street. It was a great place with lots of artists um, who were in the space. Mm-hmm. 
and it was torn down. We lost that community and we lost Is a lot that of like people. The, the big warehouse that had like kind of like 200 artists yes, in there? Yes, it was okay. a big, and, and there were two of them. There was oh, one across wow. the street, one, uh, um, it wasn't just 111, there was 110 across the street, a lot of artists in there, and that building was also torn down. So a lot of the, so there's always a push and pull, right? Mm -hmm. You always, it's, it's wonderful that, I like it when people make money. Yeah. Because when people make, I like when people's, when people's projects are successful, yeah. that makes me smile. Uh, but we also want to be sure that we don't lose our souls to be too <laughs> in, in the race. And we're lucky to be in a boom town. Mm -hmm. It could be worse. Um, we're lucky to be in a place where people are doing stuff. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, you know, the flip side of that is that, is that people in Jersey City often don't pay attention to what their neighbor is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, they're doing well on their own and they don't feel the need to connect with the person next to them or they don't feel the need to listen to what, uh, what an unfamiliar artist is saying mm -hmm. to them. Uh, they, don't, they, don't, they won't turn the dial on their internal radio to yeah. get in on someone else's wavelength. Yeah. I want there to be more uh, conversation, more criticism, more understanding. Um, and more openness to ideas that might seem a little weird at first. Yeah. Um, even if that openness is like, ah, I don't like this, tell me why. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, like to create that, start the dialogue. More dialogue. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that Jersey City still has a way to go before it reaches its saturation. There are many, many neighborhoods that haven't shared in the uh, prosperity of the downtown. Um, and sometimes we forget about those places, although there are there's amazing art made in all of those places. Many of the galleries that we've been mentioning are in, in neighborhoods that are kind of out of the way. Yeah. Uh, so we have a way to go there. Uh, we have a way to go before we are, before we reach our destiny, mm -hmm. um, whatever that destiny may be, which is, is probably gonna be something. There, there's no real reason why uh, this shouldn't be, uh, why what we do here shouldn't be known all around mm -hmm. the world. There's a tremendous amount of talent in the city. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do punch below our weight because we don't, because we're in the shadow of New York. Mm -hmm. But because of that, um, people may not pay as much attention to us as we Absolutely, deserve. Absolutely, yeah. So no, I totally agree with but you. But I'm here waving the flag. Yeah, no, please continue. You've done so <laughs> yeah. much for the community. I think a lot that we're, you know, us artists are able to, I don't know how to say this, but like, when I have ideas for like certain group shows, right? Yes. And then we'll make something happen or whatever, or a small project. And then once a review for a new goes up, it's like all of a sudden, like people go, oh, oh, I have to check this out. You know what I mean? So you do a lot, like you truly do. And thanks to you, like we're able to access people that we never thought we like have reached to. You well, know that's what I mean? beautiful of you to say thank yeah. you. I, I yeah. appreciate it. it it's um, not something that I understand is trending topics or it's not it's not a thing that um, but that's why I hope uh, that's why I try to write it in a way that's engaging yeah. I try to make it nice to you know, I try to make it fun to read because it's not necessarily what you're mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not the thing that the internet seems to best accommodate at the moment you know individual art reviews or yeah. art reviews of group shows and stuff I, I uh, I'm gonna continue to do it in one form or another because it's, do, it's yeah. meant so much to me yeah no, you do it beautifully. So going back to you, um, your musical experiences, hearing yes. you speak about music and everything, it reminded me like a hybrid cross between like Roman Abramovich, like the Thomas Hardy uh -huh. boy, and then like David Bowie, you know? I, well, uh, there's, I think anybody who does anything new wave influenced mm -hmm. at all has their Bowie, uh, has some Bowie in yeah. the algorithm. There's, there's <laughs> Uh, I grew up listening to a lot of those records. I yeah. uh, grew up listening to a lot of 70s classic rock, a lot of progressive rock. Um, I, I uh, well, okay. I mean, Aladdin Sane, um, the piano on that record, uh, is one of the real draws. That, that's a great early David Bowie record, and that is definitely a piano record where the piano playing is really, mm -hmm. it's really extreme, and it's, it's extreme in a wonderful way. And that's definitely something that I've tried to do. Now, Hunky Dory, which is an earlier David Bowie album, which I love, piano player on that record is Rick Wakeman, who uh, was the pianist in Yes. And Yes is my favorite band of, of any band ever. My favorite band is Yes. I'm a big fan of, of uh, progressive rock in general, uh, and 
Wakeman plays beautifully on Hunky Dory. He plays beautifully with the Straubs too, and those are uh, records. I can't play like that. Mm -hmm. I wish I could play like that. I think my wish to play like that is audible yeah. on my albums. So I think I think the aspiration is. I like to think the aspiration is audible there, even if the execution is not so good. And I think maybe I should get points for that. I'm not sure. Definitely. Um, yeah. Tony Banks, uh, who was the synth player in Genesis, um, is a uh, a musician who I think about all the time. Mm -hmm. and who I've attempted to emulate many times, and I think I've always fallen on my face. But uh, again, the the intention is there, <laughs> and I think I think it's meaningful that the intention is there. Yeah. Um, those are all uh, musicians that I that I, I I try to sound like, and I think that when I've played, uh, a very obvious comparison that I get a lot is Talking Heads because of the subject matter, uh, and because I'm very I'm a very nerdy person, so. <laughs> and on stage, it just means you're knowledgeable, you know. Nerd, well, you know, I have glasses, and um, uh, well, I mean, I'm nerdy is not a not for me a problem. Certainly, being compared to David Byrne is a a huge favorite of mine. Would never be a problem. Uh, but yes, Bowie, art rock, seventies in general, Brian Eno, all that stuff, mm -hmm. Kate Bush, Tori Amos, all that stuff. I think comes through. In, in what Kate I do. Bush is the. The one that kind of came back, right? Her song. Yes, Run Run it, Running Hill. Up That Hill became a hit this That's year, amazing. which just goes, goes to show you that if you do a song, yeah. you never know when. when you, if you, you do, do a, a work of art, exactly. you don't know when it's going to become. Yeah. It could be. It could. You know, it could happen years later. Yeah. Like suddenly, Kate Bush was on the top of the yeah. charts again. Can you believe that? Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of of um of weeks when they make a decision. But I have never been able to take the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame seriously mm. because Kate Bush is not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow. And everything that I hear that's modern, all modern music uh, that is well reviewed, yeah. uh, indie music, but it, even soul and uh, even the way that soul is pr produced now, it's all immensely influenced by Kate Bush. And sometimes I think that the that the era that we're in is nothing but a Kate Bush imitation uh, imitation contest. There are so many acts. Yeah. They just are they're trying to produce like Kate Bush does. They're trying to write like she does. But see, nobody can really do it. And the reason why, there's two reasons. First of all, she's an amazing piano player. She's an amazing songwriter. She's great at putting songs together. Yeah. The other reason is that her songs, and no one has ever been more specific about what she writes about. She'll do a song about about falling on a grenade. She'll do a song about being being uh, in, in the middle of the ocean uh, with a flotation device with nobody around. She'll do a song about having sex with a snowman. Mm -hmm. Her topics are unbelievably specific, and they're so well written. No one has ever been able. No one has ever been able to tell short stories like that in yeah. some way that she does. Anyway, anyways, I'm a big fan. No, uh, she's amazing, and I'm yeah. so happy for her because I saw when that song came out, I yes. started listening a little bit more to her discography. Yes. And I saw that she not only like sang the song, she did the songwriting, the producing. Yes. So she gets the whole. Yes. You know, um, royalties, which is amazing. Yes. She 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 is um, uh, an enormously. Uh, I think she's a pivotal figure in the story of music, mm -hmm. uh, almost as pivotal in her way as Joni Mitchell. Although there is no one like Joni Mitchell, there's only there will there will never be another Joni Mitchell. Uh, I think in a way, Kate Bush is is pivotal uh, in shaping the sound of what we hear as as pivotal as any figure, uh, and it's very important that she, that people remember that she came out of progressive rock. Uh, that a lot of her original champions were progressive rock artists, and she was using the musical vocabulary of progressive rock when she made the music that she made. So you're seeing the influences now that when you hear music now, you can trace a, a lot of that stuff back to the experimentation that was done in the late oh, 60s and early yeah. 70s. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And who else what is like your musical influence, I would say? Um, well, s uh, when I play the, the piano, uh, I don't think I've ever sat down at the piano and, or played another person's band and played piano and organ and that Steve Naive was not, I wasn't trying to copy him on some level. I know every Elvis Costello album uh, backwards and forward. That includes the ones that people don't like. I think some of those are some of his best albums. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's nobody who as late in his career is making more amazing music than Elvis Costello is making right now. This is uh, Elvis Costello, I love all of his records. Um, that's a big influence on the way that I play and the way that I write, Graham Parker. I mean, I, I'm listening to, s I, I've 
I, I do nothing all day but listen to music. Mm. When I'm writing, uh, I, you know, I tend to listen to seven, eight uh, albums a day. Or listen oh my to god, me too. I have yeah, a question. I'm a huge music lover. Yes. When you listen to music, are you listening to like singles or do you listen no, to I albums? No, I listen to the album all the way through. Oh wow. I, it's important for me to. to so do you go from like track one to all track all the way two through. or do you shuffle? I, I go all the way through. By order? Okay. Yes, that's wow. what I do. And I, so I will listen to, I listen to albums all day. Me too. Because I think that the album is the greatest invention yeah. that has ever been invented mm -hmm. by human beings. No, absolutely I not. think there's no better carrier of meaning and storytelling and message yeah. than the than the pop album. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just the best thing that we've ever come up with as a species. And when I think <laughs> when I think about albums and album and what they mean to me, like mm -hmm. what have you been listening to recently? Um right now you know, I listen to like so much things. Okay, this is kind of embarrassing because it's like very yeah. poppy, but I listened to like today when I was um, getting ready, I was listening to Blackout by Britney Spears. Oh yeah, sure. Because yeah. you know, just all the conservative shit. That oh yeah, news. Totally. I yeah, love. Totally. I think it's like yes. probably the best yeah. top five. Yeah. You know, I love listening to Michael Jackson like an hour before we started to Invincible. God, I love Michael Jackson. 2001, the yeah. You Rock My World. Oh yeah. Oh, I love that song. Yeah. I love Michael Jackson, yeah, I get the rock chills just thinking about I Michael know. Jackson. It's As like, a kid, I wanted to be Michael Jackson oh God, so yeah. badly. Yeah, it's like that's the, the thing with like music dropping nowadays. I remember like being a kid, yes, getting excited to like get your little allowance money, go to the store, buying the CD. I'm like, still like that. Physical, and then sitting at home, looking at the lyrics, yes. memorizing, and then looking at the notes and the I'm, thank you. I'm still that kid. I'm very I'm sad of it. Like you know, I just do it on band. Don't have that. I yeah. just do it on Bandcamp now. Yeah. I used to ride my bike to the Millburn Record Mill mm -hmm. and get records and, and memorize the records. Yeah. Now I just do it. On, now I do it on Bandcamp. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll buy the record on Bandcamp, but I'll, I'll still want to you know, yeah. learn all the words and yeah. listen to everything, yeah. listen to the albums all the way through on Bandcamp. So yeah. I do that all day. There's just like something about having like a physical CD oh, there in is. the booklet. To me, that there booklet was oh, there everything. Is. There, there so is. And if you could make it like they have the poster version. God, there so uh, is. Yeah. yeah it, it's, it's so true. I mean, I, I love, um, I, I, I love records. I, I love, I love vinyl. I love CDs. You, since you have such a, I think, an amazing music musical knowledge, do you hear a difference? A lot of people don't. Some people say they do between like vinyl and CD. I can hear the difference, yeah. but I don't think it's really that that much. I don't. Do you have a preference? You know, vinyl sounds so nice. Vinyl, vinyl does have a beautiful sound to it. Usually, people say that it's warmer, mm -hmm. um, that it's more engrossing. Um, I understand. You know, I, I, I can always hear the difference between two-inch tape and when something is recorded straight to, straight to a computer, the digital, even digital simulations of two-inch tape, though they're, they're very good now. Mm -hmm. um, but I still kind of can always, in the same way that I can tell the difference between just the, uh, the waveforms on an, on an analog synthesizer, a real yeah. analog synthesizer, will sound different from, from soft synths. Um, you can tell, but does it really matter? What matters is, how well the the people putting the music together yeah. get their ideas across to mm -hmm. me. How well do you tell the story? How well do you, what choices do you make to support what it is that you have to say? Yeah. Uh, that's what brings me back to an album again and again. And, and there are albums that I, I've been thinking about all my life and that I will always think about. And it usually has to do, and, and the music is usually there. Um, the music, the words, everything is kind of an expression of an idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the way that idea, those musical ideas are developed over a course of an album are fascinating and they continue to draw me back. I think about an album, say, like, um, well, uh, Kendrick's second album, Good Kid, Mad City, mm -hmm. is a record that I've thought about a tremendous amount mm -hmm. because there's so much happening, there's so much narrative experimentation happening yeah. on that record. Uh, we recently lost True Boy, which I think made us all go back to our De La Soul albums and remember how amazingly well structured those are. Yeah. And how they work beautifully as albums and how the storytelling works so well. Yeah. We were talking about uh, Brazilian music and I listen to a lot of um, Mexican, Colombian and Brazilian music because there are so many album artists working uh -huh. in pop styles there. Yeah. And uh, listen, thinking about Caetano Veloso's albums and the way that he puts those records together and the flow mm -hmm. and the ideas that are developed early in the album become, they come back later in different forms and the lyrical concepts that he continues to return to and just I love all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't I can't get in I can't I really can't get enough. I can get enough. No, I could tell yeah. you because before we started like yeah I was so surprised and so shocked how much you knew of um 
Brazilian music. Oh yeah. And the name of the artist, the album. Then you hear the album, and I was like, wow. You know, because a lot of people will give me like, oh, there are people like a generic. You know what I mean? Well, people are just fascinated with when yeah. Brazilian music is so there's so much to know. Yeah. Uh, Mexican music is so much to know, and uh, one of the nice things that's happened over the last ten years or so, as things have opened up a little bit more with with music, is uh, I think that we're starting to understand that. Americans are are um, are a little behind uh, that uh, that some of our music is is maybe not as exciting as what we're getting from overseas. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. Yeah, because there are more there's more experimentation and more influences coming together. Where sometimes in America we just like have what we do and we don't change. Mm -hmm. um, where I think what's happening in Mexico City is very exciting right now. Yeah. There are so the Pawa album. Um, which is about to come out, I'm very excited about. But even folk artists, like Natalia Lafortari, who's a Mexican singer-songwriter, who I think sometimes is the greatest artist in the world, uh, she is, she's essentially a folk artist, and she's doing a, a lot of old folk, uh, Mexican folk songs and incorporating motifs from that stuff into her own mm -hmm. writing. But she's using modern musicians, and she's drawing so much stuff from it. It's, it's really tremendously exciting. Yeah. Medellin seems to be a place oh yeah. where so much really so much cool happening. music yeah. is being made right now. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to go there. Lo too, I'd love yeah. to visit. So much cool stuff. Being Santiago in Chile seems yeah. to be a place where a tremendous amount of cool yeah. stuff is happening. No, that's very funny you say that because like I remember before I moved to America from Brazil, like as a kid we would listen to like Dolly Parton, like yeah. Bollywood, The Doors, Britney yeah. Spears, and then Michael Jackson. Like it was just like changing, you know. Yeah, like, totally. And then when I moved, I remember like kids asking me, "Oh, what kind of genre of music do you listen to?" Yeah. Like it had to be like a category, yes. and only that category, and it had to be in English. You know, there was no. Yeah. Like I remember MTV when I was growing up, they had like multi like culture, like it would be like Evie Queen to you yes. know what I mean, like to like Nirvana. Yeah. So it was always this like you're always so, it's like you're like on a cultural trip in a way, you know. Yes. Where here it was just like the standard. <laughs> One, two, three, like right. the two pop girls, the two rock bands, commercial Yes, you had to, you, when I was growing up, it had to be met. Everyone was into heavy metal. Yeah. Um, like, you had to be a metal fan. Yeah. Uh, and, like, I appreciated it, but I was always interested in the slightly weirder stuff in the mm -hmm. commercial metal. Now, there yeah, was yeah. a lot of really weird metal yeah, that yeah. I, I later learned to, to enjoy. Yeah. But um, at the time, you know, there was, a, there was some stuff that you were supposed to listen to, so mm -hmm. I would always want to listen to one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> So what I wanted to ask you, I saw not only you play so many musical instruments, it seems, is that correct? I play mostly synthesizer, but I do play guitar, mm -hmm. and I wrote a lot of my new stuff on bass. Um, mm -hmm. But I am not a good instrumentalist. I'm like, I'm okay. Um, I really rely on friends mm -hmm. to help me out. <laughs> I'm really the writer. Yeah. I, I, I write, I'm, I'm good at coming up with scenarios and characters yeah. and concepts. Um, maybe not as good at execution yeah. as I should be. And um, are you like a big fan of live music? Yes. Yeah, I saw. Um, do you, you have like a newsletter, right? That you you send out, or uh, do you write the, like an email and then you send I, it out? I usually write. Um, I usually write. Uh, there was a time when I was writing reviews of a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. and when I was just filling out shows mm -hmm. and writing reviews of what I saw, what my friends were doing. And that changed into once I started to be more professional, or once I started getting getting mm -hmm. gigs. Yeah. I started writing about um, name artists, mm -hmm. big pop stars. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I was writing for the for the Star Ledger, which is a, a newspaper with a very large circulation, I was obligated to go and see um, the biggest stars in the world. Yeah. So I would get the experience of seeing um, stuff that I was completely out of my my stuff that I didn't really care very much about. Yeah. I didn't know much about Kenny Chesney, but at that time, Kenny Chesney <laughs> was a big country singer. Yeah. Um, he was he was setting records for the biggest crowds oh, wow. in New Jersey, and that was an experience to see that, yeah. and I learned about that. And what I learned was that there, if you want to, you can learn music very fast. Yeah. You, can, you can catch up with the genre yeah. very quickly. You can learn the history. You can learn the important stuff. Absolutely. And you can, you can kind of fit it into the framework, and you can... There's nothing that's in pop that's that's so forbidding that you can't learn it yeah. very quickly, and uh, I love live performance. So I was doing a lot of that, and and uh, I kind of stopped doing it when Hillary couldn't go mm -hmm. out any longer. I kind of stopped writing about that, but I still write about music all the time. 
which is more local. Um, I I do a uh, I do a uh, a monthly column for Jersey City Times, which is the musical preview column. And depending upon how that develops, I may cover more live shows. Yeah. But I think I probably will. I'll probably yeah. I'll probably in the future in Jersey City I'll probably end up writing more about uh, musical performances. Yeah. Okay. No, I brought that up because I remember uh, a while ago you had, um, I think it was like the Lower East Side, you were playing the gig. Yes. And yeah. I was going to go, but then I got stuck in traffic, and by the time, I, you know what I mean, I was like all the way yeah. by like Upper West Side in the highway, and there was some type of like closure or construction. Well, on September 8th, I hope I'll have the, the people around here, it'll be easy to get to, yeah. it'll be walkable, I yeah. hope I can get a lot of people down there. Oh, definitely. Because I'll do two more, I'm going to do two more shows in New York before that show mm-hmm. on. Like the warm up, right? Yeah, I think, I think we're gonna try to warm up with the show. Okay. Um, uh, we're gonna be doing another show in Berlin in late June. Uh, and what's exciting about that show is that we're playing with a band called Office Culture, who mm-hmm. not a lot of people know about, um, but they should. Mm-hmm. They put in an album last year called Big Time Things. And I love that album and I, I honestly feel like I love it more every time I've heard it, and I must have heard it 50 times. I mean, I must have played it 50 times. Yeah. I've played it over and over again, and there's always something new to learn when I listen to it. It is a sophisticated pop album to a degree that might be a little off-putting at first. It's deeply indebted to uh, to the the very late period Joni Mitchell albums. Uh, Turbulent Indigo and Taming the Tiger, I hear overtones of both of that, those two albums. Mm-hmm. And Joni who is a tremendous songwriter, is able to do these hairpin turns with her chord structure, and you don't necessarily notice it because she's, yeah. she's so good at, at, uh, at writing that you don't notice how, wi- how far out she's yeah. going. When people try to emulate that, you do notice. And you yeah. notice that with office culture, it's like, whoa, that's, that, that was a crazy chord change they just did there. But um, it kind of doesn't matter, because once you get used to it, um, uh, the intelligence that goes into the composition is really striking. Yeah. So they're going to be doing a show, and I'll, I'll, me and a band will be playing before they play, uh, and uh, I will let everybody know about that because I, as as excited as I am to get people to see me, I like I'm more. I really want people to see Office Culture. I yeah. want people to know about this group. They are doing very very interesting stuff and big time things. All of their albums are great, but their most recent one is the best. Oh my god, I'll check it out. And you said it's going to be New York, right? It'll be in New York, in Berlin, in New York. Berlin, yeah, Berlin is not in Germany. Berlin. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Berlin, is, Berlin is on the Lower East Side. Yeah, yeah. definitely. No, I'll definitely make sure, if you're comfortable with this place, to include all the upcoming events. Oh, yeah, totally. And yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to let people know about that oh, show please, for sure. Yeah, because for I, want sure. People, I want people to, he- to see Office Culture and hear that record because um, it's a very unusual album. Yeah. And his. Uh, his narrators are, are very unusual. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, they're, uh, his perspective is yeah. singular. Yeah. And, uh, and that's the thing that grabs me more than any other album, more than any other thing about an album. When the perspective that's being articulated by yeah. the front person is singular, mm-hmm. when it doesn't sound like anybody else, then uh, when, when their outlook, uh, when their vision is their own, mm-hmm. I, then I feel like I, I just, yeah. then I want to return always. Yeah. I was just thinking, um, like when you're talking about like the, it reminded me of like uh, Pink Floyd's "Another Brick in the Wall" yes. when he starts yelling in the, like in the end of the song, uh-huh. and there's like all those noises. Yeah. And you're like, oh yes. wow, this is so. I remember yes. being a kid, like, oh my gosh, you know. Oh this yeah. Is so cool. I love Pink Floyd. I know, and I love the song "Time." Oh yes. Oh, that's my cool. third favorite band ever yeah. is Pink Floyd. Really? I would have mentioned I, I should have mentioned Rick Wright, another enormous influence. Yeah. Him. But I, I feel like Rick Wright is actually so good that it, that it's that it's a little intimidating. Yeah. Um, and I think when people think about Pink Floyd, they think about Rick Wright third. Mm-hmm. They, after Roger Waters and David Gilmour, if they think about him at all. But his, we're all trying to do on synthesizer what he did almost effortlessly in the '70s. Yeah. We're all trying to catch up with Rick Wright, and I don't think we have. I, when you listen to what he did on Wish You Were Here, in particular, mm-hmm. uh, on some of, some of the sounds that he got on Shine On Crazy Diamond, it's just outrageous. We've been trying to do that. Yeah. We've been trying to emulate that, and we can't do it. So, yes. What do you think about uh, Jim Morrison? I love him. Songwriting? Lo- I love him. I think he's a wonderful, wonderful front man. Mm-hmm. Great, very exciting. Kind of taught people how to be a dark front man. Yeah. You know what I mean? How, yeah. how to incorporate dark themes into yeah. the music. And... Uh, I get distracted um, when I hear The Doors by, by, uh, by Ray Manzarek even more than Jim Morrison because Ray Manzarek's uh, electric piano is another thing that I have riffed off quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I 
they it's not rip off tribute. You're yes, it's tribute. tribute. I, there are some, there are things in my yeah. songs that that you could tell that I've heard the Doors once or twice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Interest. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been Thank a you. truly pleasure. I'm honored. And you are the first episode for season three. Excellent. So that's an amazing thing. Um, would you mind giving us your website and Instagram, please? If you want to know more about me, then then you probably want to know. You can always go to trismccall.net. So T-R-I-S-M-C-C-A-L-L dot net. And that is a very deep uh, geological strata of my writing going back for decades. Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff about music on there, a lot of stuff about stuff from my music. And uh, there's, uh, there's fiction uh, on that site as well. But if you really want my fiction, if you're really interested in my fiction and music and, you're in, and you don't mind listening to demos, uh, a great site to visit is McCall's Almanac, which is www.mccallsalmanac.com. Now, McCall's Almanac uh, is a series of songs that I wrote really in 2015, 2016. Each of those songs was uh, narrated by a different character representing a different American city. And I wrote the song and a short story at the same time. So if you if there's a map of the United States and you go and you see the different characters, you can click on the character. Uh, they're illustrated by, by a cartoonist. Uh, so let's say you go to Pennsylvania. There's a song that's set in Philadelphia. You can click on that guy or a song set in Pittsburgh. And you get the song, a demo version of the song, the lyrics, a couple recommendations that are now out of date about the city, and also a uh, short story sung, uh, written from oh the perspective gosh, of so a cool. character. And some of those short stories are very, very good. Now, the way that we designed the site, you've got to scroll to get to the yeah. short stories. I don't know if people ever scroll, but uh, let me give a little plug that uh, uh, that if you're if if you if you don't mind a, a relatively light story, that's that's a long story. My story that's set in Madison, Wisconsin, I think is very interesting. I love the the Louisiana story, and that's all on McCall's Almanac. Uh, you can always find my writing on Jersey City Times. I've been writing there. Uh, I've been writing a lot for njarts.com, which is a great uh, web, and then njarts.net, sorry, which, which is a great New Jersey Arts Daily, which is, which is a great website um, that covers the entire state. And uh, my Instagram is Tris McCall underscore NJ. So Excellent. at Tris McCall underscore, T-R-I-S-M-C-C-A-L-L underscore Perfect. NJ. I was just about to say, can you spell it for us? Yes, <laughs> yes, and it is pictures of a lot of pictures of old buildings and parks. And oh, really like beautiful that. pictures. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you. It's been a pleasure thank having you. Thank you. I really thank appreciate you, it. Having Bye. Me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Tariq Talk. Follow Tariq Talk on all social media channels and check out the video interviews online.